David had lived in a small town of Pixley his entire life. The town was situated in the heart of California's agricultural region, surrounded by sprawling feeds of grapes, almonds, and citrus orchards. However, one morning he had to make a trip to Sacramento for a doctor's appointment, and his mom was taking him, but to his surprise, his dad decided to come along. The appointment went smoothly and great. The next day, David's father asked him if he wanted to come with him to his work to pick up his check and let his employer know why he was gone the day prior. As we entered his office, he looked over at us like he was expecting us already. The employer threw the check at his father. With anger on David's father's face, he tried to explain why he was missing, but the employer did not seem to care at all and told David's father to leave. Without a job, it left David's family in a difficult situation. They couldn't stay in Pixley for long without a source of income. Also, they were only able to stay in Pixley for a couple months, and it started to drain their savings. His father searched for months to find a place that is hiring and had no luck with it. Fortunately, David's aunt Christina lived in the area of Point Reyes, and she was able to help them look for a job nearby. After a long day of job searching, David's father was able to secure a position in one of the ranches that were near the area of Point Reyes. The family packed up their belongings and moved to their new home in Point Reyes. David felt curious about the nature and miles of forest that stretched across the land in Point Reyes. David knew that he was secure in this place since he had visited this place before, and it was kind of familiar to him. When he arrived at the new place, he felt happy, since the job benefited his family in a huge way. It was a chance for him to explore new things and try new things. At first, David didn't know what to do since he had just moved hours away from Pixley. However, in Point Reyes, he discovered workshops at school with all sorts of tools and machines to weld and make woodshop projects. At first, David was hesitant. He was used to being dependent on other people, but in his new place, there was nobody stopping him. He started small, creating small wooden trinklets and working his way up to larger projects like furniture and even metal projects like fireplaces. It was a new world for him, and he enjoyed it. It was a fun and creative way for him to use his skills and knowledge. As the years went on, David continued to improve his skills he never would have had the chance to try new things if it wasn't with the move to Point Reyes. It was a challenging time for his family, but it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to him and his family. My brother looks at my bookshelf and sees a regular piggy bank. I see a story. Last year I took part in a project known as Lovejoy where a small group of five drama students, myself included, taught special needs students how to act and perform on stage. We helped them write and stage a play. I was paired with a nonverbal and physically impaired student named Haim. I was nervous. What will he be like? How will we communicate? Will this even work out? Haim turned out to be one of the most inspiring humans I have ever met. He's immensely creative, but doesn't have the means to communicate due to his condition. Even though we had assistance from the teachers, it was hard to get Haim to open up about himself and his interests. The play is about the dreams of special needs students, things they dreamed they could do or that they loved doing. After multiple weeks with Haim, he started to open up around me and feel comfortable. I felt his trust in me, which gave me this enormous sense of pride that Haim would choose me as a friend. He would communicate with me through a typed speech app on his iPad. Haim would tell me about his 10 siblings, his family, his favorite beach, and what he loves most about school. After about three weeks of getting to know each other, we had to come up with an idea for our section of the play. What is Haim's dream? Haim decided that he wanted his dream section to be about the moment the stay-at-home order was lifted and he was able to take the bus back to school and see all his friends. After another three weeks of writing and rehearsing it, it was time to perform. Next was the thing I was most worried about. Haim was shy. It took a while for Haim to get comfortable around me, so I was worried what would happen if we put him in front of a full house of 300 people. Before the show, he typed that he was nervous on his iPad and that he didn't want to go on stage. I told him that he'll do great and that all these people came to see him perform. So he pushed forward and managed to perform in front of a live audience of peers and guests. What inspires me most is Haim's optimism and positivity. Haim has faced so many struggles and hardships, things that others can't even comprehend, and at such a young age. Yet he is always smiling. Haim changed my outlook on my own life, my own opportunity, my own privilege. He taught me that no matter what, you can still smile, even in light of a bad situation. Haim and his family gave me a piggy bank as a gift with the instructions to insert money and donate to someone in need or a charity once it is full, so we can spread the love and positivity.
Hello, I'm Mary. Ça, c'est moi quand j'étais au Sénégal. Je me sentais confortable, libre, joyeuse, drôle, aimée. J'aimais comment t'en parler partout où je suis. But that's me also when I come to live in the United States. I felt uncomfortable, ignored, and neglected. Do you know how it feels like when you're trying to talk to people and they do not understand what you're talking about? Yes, I do. Well, before you ask me about my accent, I'm a dual nationality, and I spent my whole life in Senegal. I came to live in the United States when I was 14 years old at the middle of the pandemic because my parents preferred the Senegalese education. I used to come every summer and go back to my land, but this time, is to stay and learn new things. As a teenager, my everyday life changes suddenly and I don't have things that I used to have. I was not in a school that I used to be in. Do not see people that I used to see and do not talk to people that I used to talk to. My first day of school was online and I didn't understand anything. I used to take video during class so afterward, I could take my time and look for a translation. How many times did I cry? I don't know. A year after that, I started going to high school, which was the hardest thing I have been through in my life. I felt so uncomfortable talking to people, and I'm a talkative person, and my friends know that. I was like, this is not me. I'm not quiet. I used to give my opinion to people, so why am I scared of talking? My job helps me a lot. I can spend a whole day seeing new people, trying to help them, and they give me confidence. Now I have to keep my heads up and be myself and stop being scared. I don't want to be perceived as a lonely person, especially I don't want to feel sorry. A letter to the offspring of donor 2447. Dear offspring of donor 2447, I have tried to say this to you in person, over the phone, and in countless deleted texts and emails. I always thought this would go unsaid, but after deepening my resolve, I decided to try one more time. So here goes. It's funny how you can feel like you have known someone since the beginning of time, except it's only been seven years. Whenever we are reunited, it reminds me that our lives were meant to be interconnected. So much so, it is hard to pinpoint exactly where that connection begins and where it ends. So much so, The rest of the world cannot put us in the box they use to categorize siblings. So, most of the time, we are just shoved in the box that holds the few people that match us exactly. The ones with just enough similar physical features to raise genetic alarm, but not enough for them to be considered family. The ones who will never get the validation from the place everyone craves it from most. Mainstream society. The same society that does not accept my parents, friends, and immediate family. Because none of them chose to be modeled into what society wanted them to be. The moment I realized that if conventional society smiles and calls us adorable, she is tricking us into thinking she validated us, when really she is just playing with our emotions using her own thread. After that realization seeped into my brain, another one took its place. When that happened, I realized that the cycle of quick hellos that led to long guttural goodbyes would be worth it every time. Because in the wake of my salt glazed eyes and the haze that followed hours of sobbing, a smog covered path towards our next meeting would always appear. Because of that, 
I know that if I keep that reminder at the forefront of my brain, I will always get through the pain, one step at a time. And with that comes the knowledge that because we are all scattered across the Earth's cosmos, our connection has strengthened beyond belief. That is because we choose to answer the calls. We choose to skip days of school to fly across the country for coming-of-age ceremonies. We could have chosen to stay home and let the thread of our connection fly away, never to be seen again. But we didn't, and I don't think we ever will. It is a battle of will for sure, but one we always choose to fight. I never used to believe that our family connection, constructed by one man, six women, and a four-digit number combo, would or could strengthen through the years. Honestly, I thought it would become weak and then fly away forever. But when I realized we have kept our connection alive for years, and in order to break it now, we would have to intentionally snuff the flames that created our bond, breaking a piece of our souls forever. I don't think that any of us have the emotional capacity to do so. Therefore, our squid ink colored thread can't be broken. When I realized how lucky we are to both love and like each other, I realized that we could never, ever waste our connection. If we did, that would be a grave mistake. Especially since there are so many people who aren't lucky enough to experience what we have. So, to the offspring of donor 2447, no matter what the future holds, none of us can let the thread fly away. I know I won't. I became an artist after I'd always watch big animated films and be amazed at the images I could create from a computer. That's when I started to create art. I started out creating art thinking it'd be hard at first. It was so complicated and confusing. But the more time went on, I got better. With my art, I wanted to create images that showed emotion and tone. I felt my ideas were getting bigger faster than my skill. I started to get annoyed and frustrated. This started my never-ending task of finding perfection. Perfection is something that feels always just out of reach. It feels like nothing I make is perfect. While creating art, I always end up getting to a moment where whatever I'm making looks nothing how I wanted it to. I am redoing and redoing and I can't get anything right. Then it was hard to start projects because I was afraid I would mess it up all over again, which makes it harder to enjoy working on art. Sometimes I try to work on a project but I end up turning on music and just sitting there, unable to make a change. I need to be fine with the mistakes and flaws. I need to be able to see the work how it is. I can't just expect everything to go perfectly and end up looking exactly how I want it to. When I look at other people's work online, everything looks perfect. Online everything looks so good and so easy, but what you don't see is all the time it took to create their work and all the time of their frustration. Now I can look back to my art and see just how good it is. I can see for what it is and not for what I meant it to be. Those little mistakes make it unique and not look exactly the same as everyone else's. Now I need to be fine with my work not being perfect.
I became an adult at age 12 as a defense mechanism. I shut down completely by being alone and at risk of abandonment, always in a position to say goodbye forever. Forever is a sad word. It means never ending or never coming back. So I did what I had to do to find myself. When I was 14, I went to a boarding school summer program. That's when I met him. It was the most beautiful East Coast summer day. At 10.30 a.m., the sun was at its peak. The colorful flowers were blooming and the grass was vibrantly green. When I saw him, I got a feeling of internal happiness from his chocolate brown eyes to his beautiful tan skin and his perfectly braided hair. Everything about this boy made my crushed inner child happy again, but I got a gut feeling that he would break my heart, and my gut feeling was right. It was like being 12 all over again. People have left me before, and he will too. The grass started to wither and the plants started to die, and my beautiful boy picked substances over me. Sadly, he found another flower who he treated like a goddess. Why not me? Why can't I get treated with love and respect? It is a sick game to play with people's feelings and leave their soul broken. I always thought he was the right person just at the wrong time, but he was never the right person. I see that now. I got the message. He never loved me. The truth is that if someone is okay with losing you, they never cared about you in the first place. I don't know if this is selfish, but when I see a happy couple, I get sick to my stomach and the memories come flooding back. It all goes back to him. It all goes back to being 12. All my life, it has been a defense mechanism. It starts here with you and me. It ends with us. The first day of soccer, you're nervous because you don't know anybody. That's when your social anxiety hits. You see someone but don't want to go up to talk to them because you don't want to seem annoying or pestering. Great. There goes your overthinking again. So you walk away wishing someone would stop and talk to you because you're too afraid to talk to them first. Coach then tells you all to get in partners and pass the ball around, but you can only look hopelessly at all your other teammates who have already played soccer before and already know each other. You just stare at the ball on the ground, completely zoned out from reality, hoping someone would come up to talk to you and ask you to pass, but no one does. Your mind starts to feel blank and you can feel tears forming in your eyes, not knowing what to do next, when all of a sudden you hear a little voice saying hello to you. You slowly tilt your head up and your heart goes from empty to racing with joy when you see a girl with a soccer ball in her hand standing right in front of you. She then asks if you want to pass the ball around. You smile as you agree. You then play pass for a while and get to know her, and something about you guys just clicked. Maybe it was her energetic personality. Maybe it was the fact you both are new to soccer. Or maybe it was just because you two were meant to meet and become friends. You leave the first soccer practice with a wonderful story to tell about your new friend, smiling as you talk to her to your family at the dinner table. And the next practice, you aren't dreading to go. This time, you're so excited because you actually have a friend to play soccer with. And soon, you both are begging your parents to hang out because you guys bring so much joy to each other. You both continue soccer for many years together because you've inspired each other to continue the sport and try to get better at it. When you lost your championship game, you were so upset but she was always there to wipe away your tears. And she always came up with random jokes that made you laugh so hard it hurt. There was a test in school, you and your new friend studied together, but you usually got caught up laughing. So trying something new can change your life in the best ways. Twelve years later, I have formed a massive passion for soccer and I now play with a competitive team four times a week. I also made the most unexpected friendship with a girl who I'm so happy I met. The earliest part of my life that I can remember was going to the JCC, which was a Jewish school in LA. That place was like a second home to me. All my friends were there, we held every celebration there, and we spent time familiarizing ourselves about our culture. I don't have many memories from then, but I do remember it being my favorite school year. Here I was happy, comfortable, and I didn't realize it wouldn't last forever. I moved to Palo Alto, where we bought a really tiny house for a very big price. I started elementary school, but there was only one person that was actually my friend. Nobody else that I was around treated me well except my teachers. 
but I remember that so many people didn't like me back then. But I never realized it, so luckily I wasn't able to let it bother me. At the time it felt normal, but now I look back and feel I didn't belong there. When I look back on these years, I can't tell if they lasted long or ended abruptly. My parents told me that I was moving to Marin for middle school. The first year I spent online due to COVID-19. It was hard to talk to people through a little box on my computer, let alone become friends with them. I only started to be able to talk to people a year later. Having to go to school online was so confusing. The year went by very quickly. I didn't do any assignments since I didn't know how to do them. It was such an empty year that I feel like it never happened. I can't recall any memories from then, whether it be in school or outside. I was confused. Before I even realized it, I was in late eighth grade and I was moving away from high school. But it felt like my life went so fast. It felt like yesterday I was still in elementary school. I only now realize that time doesn't slow for anyone. But it's too late now. I'm leaving more than just middle school. I'm leaving my home, my friends, and even my family. I'm moving to a whole new continent and now everything before just seems like a fading memory. Look forward to tomorrow and you miss today. Appreciate every moment like it's your only because time is always taking away. All my life, I have craved excitement, continuous, everlasting feelings that life has to offer. I wanted to feel the flow of emotions as they come and go, whether they are scary, dark, and emotive, or playful, fun, and enthusiastic. I would at least be feeling something. I would at least be caught in the ever-changing movement of life. I would at least know what it feels like to live. It never felt that way, though. It was just uncomfortable stability. Nothing changed nor happened. When the slightest exciting event occurred, I would get attached. And anybody who has truly lived before would know that the beautiful thing about life is that nothing stays the same. I seemed to love waiting for someone to come up to me and change my life. Someone with a colorful aura. Someone with flourished accomplishments. Someone that could adapt me to life. It doesn't work. No matter how bright and accepting the person, I would always be their friend that has never and will never experience true emotion. Like a singular flower on a blossoming rose bush, I would never be as extraordinary as the source I was created from. In the end, I realized that all I really ever wanted was to be them, and now I've placed myself in their shadow. In that shadow, in that dark, gloomy place, all I could think about myself was the things I missed out on, or the way I didn't look, or the people that didn't like me. It was hard to get out of that loop. It felt like I was spiraling into a dark pit where light and color could never reach, and where plants and life could never grow. So what's stopping me? What's stopping me from crawling out of that pit, to become the sort of person that lives and dies and lives all over again? The first to be invited and the last to leave. The one you will always find in a beautiful place looking beautiful. And when they aren't in that beautiful place, they are feeling and adapting all just to become a better person. What if it doesn't exist? What if I'm reaching for an impossible figure of haze? Yet they seem so close in my mind. So close I could almost become them. I think I was spending too much time thinking about what I had to do to become this person in my imagination. I thought so much that along the way I realized they would never be thinking this much. They would be acting on it. They wouldn't be lying in their bed waiting for things to change. They wouldn't be too shy to start a conversation. They wouldn't be. They wouldn't be. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be living like this. I wouldn't be imagining what I can so easily become.